The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hi, this is Ashley Eckstein, the voice of Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars, and you're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast. May the Force be with you. You're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars, episode 156. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember... The Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Robert King, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away. From movies to books to TV shows and more, we're looking at the deeper themes and meanings found in Star Wars. Today, we'll be talking about The Mandalorian, Chapter 22. That's Episode 6 of Season 3, titled Guns for Hire. Joining me today on the panel are Jason Yuji. Hi, how's everybody doing? And Joshua Beagley. Hello, hello. Right on. It is great to have the both of you on the panel today, and I am I have been looking forward to this ever since I saw The Mandalorian. But before we get to the episode, there are a couple things that dropped at um Star Wars Celebration Europe. Um the first of them is of course the first trailer we've seen first full trailer for the ahsoka series um i'm so excited did you guys have a chance to see it <laughs> yes uh i loved i loved it to say the least yeah i can't i can't wait man i'm i'm just thrilled it's yeah it it looks amazing i loved seeing uh like the the um the sites and the characters that i had so fallen in love with in rebels shown in live action um i have to admit i struggle a little um sabine with long hair okay a little bit <laughs> um but uh it has been yeah, a few years it has been a few years and um yeah it it's just going to be great to see how these uh different actors uh embody these characters that i know from animation um what what did you have any like favorite moments or or insights or anything from the trailer i think right off the bat when she cuts that hole in the floor with her lightsabers (laughs) and that was a strong start (laughs) (laughs) yeah how about you josh i loved so like there's that brief like flashing of like the rebel Jedi and whatnot. And after Jedi master uh-huh. or not master, uh, the droid Huang or Hu Yang, yes. however you pronounce it, um, showed up. I love that episode of the Clone Wars and seeing that he uh-huh. survived order 66 was incredible. And then I also loved seeing the back of Thrawn. Um, that was a really cool scene as, or like shot as well. Very careful not to show his face, not to reveal yeah. the actor. I'm yeah. excited to see who the actor is and how how well they obviously like brought him into live action. And she used the term "heir to the Empire." That was the name of Th- of Zahn's first book. So right. I'm really you know, and we know that Mount Tantus, which has been in R- Bad Batch has been mm-hmm. brought into canon. So that was first introduced in in the heir to the empire. So I'm really interested to see how much of that stuff they're going to bring into canon. It's yeah, a lot going on. There's a uh, a character in heir to the empire, well, not a character, a creature that Thrawn wants to get and it I can't remember the name of the creature, but I know it was on planet Merc Merker, I think. And uh it creates like a, a bubble around that creature that the force can't be used. So in that, in that novel, Luke Skywalker can't use his, uh, the force when he's, cause Thrawn keeps those creatures around him. 
So I'm really interested to see if they're going to do that since uh, a Jedi is a, is tracking him. That that would be interesting. I have to admit, that is one of the things that I just did not like at all about Timothy Zahn's novels. Um, it felt like it broke the force for me. If there oh, are yeah. living creatures where the force doesn't work around them, that kind of breaks the idea of the force as being, you know, generated by all living things and being this, you know, it surrounds us, penetrates us, binds the galaxy together, binds the universe together. That kind of universal metaphysical status that the force had. Um, yeah, so so I'm kind of hoping they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I didn't you, read the Thrawn books, so I don't know as much about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> They're uh, pretty good. I've I've heard great things about both the you know the the original Timothy's on Thrawn trilogy and his new one that that he did since Disney has taken over. I've heard well, great things about actually those as no, well. I think there's two trilogies that he's done. Okay, one one that the first one he did sets up how Thrawn got into the Empire and then runs it right up into Rebels. And then, it, and then you catch, catch on this, the story from him through this, the TV show Rebels. But then they did a prequel to that trilogy about how... Uh, and I haven't read all of that yet, but I think it's about how Thrawn, you know, works his way up in, in his... through his uh, people cool what did you guys think about the um the two uh dark side force users i'm presuming inquisitors of some sort but i'm not sure what what did you what did you guys think about those two figures it was a sith santa <laughs> sith santa <laughs> no. I, I saw him he just had this sith perfect white beard and i'm like that's a sith santa <laughs> no I thought I thought he was actually an interesting character because he wasn't wearing a standard inquisitor outfit. Like yes it was all black but it wasn't the same as the other inquisitors and what they wore. Mm -hmm. So it made me think of if that person was just someone who fell to the dark side and isn't a part of like the inquisitors and is just like a Sith now. Um that happened with Malachor on Dathomir in Fallen Order. Um, he was mm -hmm. a fallen Jedi who's just sort of succumbed to the dark side and now embraces it. And I wonder if they'll actually play with that idea since Ahsoka's considered like that gray Jedi where she's not actually in the Order and she just walks the line in the middle. Could be. And did Jason? Did, sur did the Inquisitors survive past the battle for Endor? Did they even survive past uh, the battle for Yavin? I don't remember seeing them in canon after that. I don't know if it was discussed much after that. I know that they were in Rebels, which means that they would be up to episode six, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... They would be they would be somewhere still in the original trilogy, but I don't know if they would exist afterwards, which is when this is taking place. Right. Not clear exact it's it's in the, the Mandoverse timeline, you know, so set sometime after yeah. Return of the Jedi. Five, um, seven, eight, something like that. <laughs> something like that. Um but yeah, we don't know. Um and I mean, Palpatine has been known to have multiple, uh, if not exactly apprentices, other dark side users, um, arguably breaking the rule of two. Um, so lots of possibilities. I'm excited to see where that goes. <laughs> I, yeah. So it's going to drop in August, which is... A little ways away, but not a huge way. So uh, that's that's going to be, yeah, definitely something to look forward to through the summer. The other thing they announced was 
three new Star Wars movies. And they had pretty much, Lucasfilm had pretty much dropped all like big screen Star Wars announcements. Um, yeah, like a month ago. Yeah. They made it like, pretty clear that they weren't, well, they weren't going to make those particular movies. Um, Rogue Squadron and a couple others that they had planned. That they had announced before. So so there's a sense in which I, I kind of want to take these announcements with a grain of salt because they've dropped others that they had previously announced. But the plan is is really interesting. Um, they say three new movies helmed by three different directors, one by James Mangold, which will go back to the dawn of the Jedi, uh, one by Dave Filoni, which will focus on the New Republic and close out the interconnected stories told in The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba, Boba Fett, Ahsoka, and other Disney Plus series. And then uh, Charmaine Obaid, I'm going to mangle this name, I'm afraid. Charmaine Obaid Chinoy, who uh, is known from some Disney um, Marvel properties, uh, is going to do a film set after the events of Star Wars Rise of Skywalker will feature Daisy Ridley back as Rey as she builds a new Jedi Order. So it sounds like they're going to use these movies to kind of do, I think, what they had originally planned to do with the sequel trilogy um, and, and like close off the Skywalker saga and then start moving into a new era of Star Wars. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm intrigued by these uh these three very different uh movies that they've announced. When I think about that one you're talking about with Dave Filoni, I all I can think about is Avengers Assemble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much a, a a big crossover movie event. Yeah. I think that one would actually be really interesting to see because we do have like a lot of these events happening at the same time in between episodes six and seven and getting them all to sort of come together again would be an interesting to, thing to see. But like the main movie I was talking about with people on our discord and stuff was the Ray, the Ray um, yeah. episode. And obviously Daisy Ridley's characters had a lot of the hate throughout the the sequel trilogy. Um, to an extent, I see this as a way for them to Both of you on the panel rebuild today? that hate hatred and sort of like the dislike for parts of her character. Use your hatred. <laughs> <laughs> well, like my main issue with her was that, or her character was that she didn't seem to have any issues with any of her learning of the force or anything she seemed to just be this perfect character who just pick it up in an instant um mm, mm -hmm. like using force lightning whenever it took dooku like a long time to master that and she uses it like it's nothing do you see retcons coming i'm not the smartest um what does retcon mean <laughs> oh uh <laughs> retroactive continuity where they you know later on they they put something into the movie or the TV show to explain a plot hole that happened. Oh, you know, I mean, they, they do that all before. the time. I mean, yeah. that was the whole sort of starting of Rogue One was why would they ever, you know, put this huge ventilation shaft that goes right through to the core? Yeah. And they'll they'll definitely do that. And I see this movie as a way for them to fix those things and sort of make her character more whole. I'm still in the camp that maybe they're going to use the world between worlds and do a, a time reset. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, and then if, you know, based off one, I've seen several theories about how it could go down, you know, at this point, if this, you know, if this happened, it goes down the timeline that we see where this, we have the, the canon sequels as they are now. And then if one little thing changes, it goes to another timeline and now they can have a new, you know, maybe Ray had to go through all these different struggles that she didn't have to in this other timeline or, or something, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of 
predict in a time shift. I, I've been wrong on a lot of my predictions and on these <laughs> podcasts, but <laughs> that's I'm still holding well, out. Why on that stop one. now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man, yeah i I always liked Ray as a character. I I do think that the I I I don't think she was. Uh, done any worse than any of the other characters in the sequel trilogy. I mean, I I think each one of those movies in the sequel trilogy had a lot of interesting ideas and and great potential, but the lack of a of an overall guiding hand to say these three movies are going to tell one story. Um, I think that made them all suffer. Um, and and Ray obviously suffered from that. And I I don't blame people for calling her a flat or a shallow character or, you know, accusing her of Mary Sue syndrome. Um, as, as you say, Josh, you know, the force just came really easily. And I think because they didn't know what kind of struggle to give her, um, because they didn't know what kind of story they were telling. Um, so yeah, my hope is that it'll be more than just an attempt to, fix Ray and, and fix the sequel trilogy, um, that it really will be a new beginning in establishing Ray, not fixing what she was, but establishing something for her to be maybe going on into the future. Um, cause yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, even if Disney dropped the ball on, on the sequel trilogy in a lot of ways. Well, that's a lot to talk about, but we're not here to talk about all those other things. <laughs> we're here to talk about the Mandalorian. Um, I, you know, I am, I know this season of the Mandalorian is, has been divisive among the fan base and it's, uh, interesting to me. I have really enjoyed it and it's like evidence to me. It's proving to me that the Mandalorian as a series can handle like the entire tonal range of star Wars. Um, a few episodes back, it touched on the gritty realism of Andor. And in this episode, it's jumped kind of both feet into the lore dropping character building, semi comedic side quests that formed so much of, of all the animated series. But it also, built on a number of the themes that this season has been exploring themes like belonging and authority and redemption and justice. Um, so, so let me give a quick summary of the latest episode for everybody who loves the spoilers of this show. Um, we get an opening sequence in which the Mandalorians who abandoned Bo-Katan and they are led by uh, Axe Woves, I always want to say wolves, but, but whoa, axe woves. Um, and they abandoned Bo-Katan because she didn't have the dark saber. Right. Um, so they are out, uh, fulfilling a bounty hunting contract to return a Mon Calamari prince who ran away with a Quarren captain. They love each other very, very much, but the prince's parents want him back. So we have these star crossed lovers and um, they are interrupted by the Mandalorians who take the Mon Calamari Prince back to his parents. And then we catch up with Din and Bo-Katan, who are looking for these very Mandalorians to unite them with the Children of the Watch and retake Mandalore. They find them on the verdant world of Plazir 15 as the contracted defenders of a direct democracy co-headed by a former Imperial who completed the New Republic's amnesty program and the uh, Duchess of the royal family that had ruled this planet. Before, they, before Din and Bo-Katan can meet the other Mandalorians, they have to help these co-leaders solve their little droid problem. It seems some of the city's service droids who are really reprogrammed battle droids are acting increasingly violently and the city has no one who can take them down. So Din and Bo-Katan in true buddy cop fashion track down the source of the malfunctions, some malware nanobots introduced by the city's own security chief, 
a secret separatist who thinks Count Dooku was a visionary who was cut down by the Jedi Enforcer. But Bo-Katan stuns him before he can say Anakin's name. She doesn't like talking politics. So now that they've solved this droid problem, they can meet with the other Mandalorians. Bo-Katan confronts Axe Woves and his band of Mandalorian mercenaries, challenges him to a duel, and defeats him, but they still won't accept her authority because she doesn't have the Darksaber. Din steps forward at this point and argues that it rightfully belongs to her because she defeated the enemy that defeated him. The mercenaries agree, and Bo-Katan reclaims the Darksaber. It's time to retake Mandalore. So I glossed over a lot. <laughs> I glossed over cameos from Jack Black, Lizzo, Christopher Lloyd. It was a star-studded episode. Uh, there were a bazillion or so Easter eggs dropped, uh, maybe just in time for Easter. Um, <laughs> so there's a ton to talk about. Um, let's just start with what if we start with the star-crossed lovers um how did how did that sort of little mini event fit the episode for you and fit into the star wars universe yeah um i i thought it was sort of interesting to see to say the least so her in her water tank or back to tank i don't know what it was um i think water i think it was water because i believe that's an aquatic species of sort um, yeah, that was their their answer to needing needing to be in the water. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've yeah. heard that Mon Calamari ships are really humid. I guess that's the difference. Interesting. The yeah. two the two species shared the a home planet and and were like yeah. at war with each other for ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know what it seems like to me is Romeo and Juliet. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you got you got the two families in this instance, two species and you know, the, the species don't like each other. And now you've got the kids who want, you know, want to get past all that and, you know, be together. But the parents are like, mm, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was also funny too. Whenever the male was like, I thought you guys were honorable. It's like, we are for a few bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a great line <laughs> it, it was such a funny little punchline and it was also just kind of like what really defines honorable then for them as well I mean like they're trying to make their own living and that scene is honorable to them I guess and they're helping sort of keep with their other people's traditions of however their marriages or whatnot may be well bounty hunting at least and, and mercenary work in general has been kind of associated with Mandalorians from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Boba Fett was a bounty hunter. Um, Din Djarin was introduced to us as a, as a bounty hunter. And, and he's presented in season one with a puck that talks about a, uh, a Mon Cala noble whose son dis like is on the lamb and he's presented oh, with a puck. That. So it's a, uh, a lot of people are saying it's probably the same character. Oh, wow. I didn't notice that one. That would mess with the timeline, though, or or at least because... Or just say that he's been on the lam for a couple of years. For, yeah, several yep. years. Yeah. Star Wars has a, uh, let's say, a mixed record when dealing with romance. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you... <laughs> did you buy the romance in in this? It was pretty cheesy. I, I feel like it would have been better if we knew the characters better. Um, I guess that's also part of sort of having a love relationship is that you want to get invested into it and like see the love develop rather than it being just kind of like, oh, I love you. I'm like, I don't even know I who you, you are. I love you too. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost it's almost like Doug from Up, you know. Hello, I've just met you and I love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're very we're very used to uh 
like the idea of, you know, absolute autonomy and, you know, who you choose to love, who you choose to marry and, and so on. And, and that's, I mean, that's one of the foundational pieces of, of our Christian faith is that marriage is a choice by the people who are getting married. Um, I mean, that's the reason we have, we celebrate virgin martyrs from the early church because they were, um, they were claiming the freedom that they had in Christ to not get married to the people their parents told them they needed to marry. Um, but as you said, this is, this is kind of a very Shakespearean situation. And, um, and like, I don't know, is, is there a, I just think it's, it's very interesting to see uh, the response, the royal responsibilities of, of someone to marry presented in this way. And, um, I don't know the, the kind of, the kind of culture that, that it, it implies about the star Wars universe. Well, I think it's just like, you know, our culture and our world, there's many cultures, you know, it's, you know, you have some cultures that still today, believe that it's okay to, for arranged marriages and things like that. And then cultures that aren't And it in the star Wars universe, each planet, the planet as a whole, the world as a whole is like a nation, you know, so you've got your different cultures in each, in each of those nations and everybody can live together. And, you know, we would call it the global society. They call it the galactic society. Right. Mm -hmm. And everybody mm -hmm. can live together, hopefully in peace. It, although, well, I mean, it doesn't always work that way. It's why it's called star Wars, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, but I think it's, it's a representation of their galactic society is a representation of our global society is what I'm getting at. Hmm. So you've got, you've got these many different cultures and, and not, you know, who's to say which one is right. I sort of see it differently is that stars has always been this world where they bring in those different things like arranged marriages, wanting your own choice. Um, and all of these different sort of cultural things that we see in our world, like how you were saying of this sort of like global sense of everyone has their own different views um with that it's just always been that in star wars i feel like there's always some sort of species who has their own culture their own beliefs and some other people aren't going to accept that right and it's sort of just finding the balance i guess in a world of everybody <laughs> <laughs> i like that finding the balance in a world of everybody Interestingly enough, the the planet, culture, city, nation, however you want to consider it, of Plazir 15 kind of describes itself as a, I, I forget the exact term they use, but a, a cosmopolitan society that they, they were open to all kinds of people. Um, and they describe themselves as a direct democracy, letting the people rule. What did what were your impressions of of Plazir fifteen? At first, it looked like I thought they were going. It was a Mandalore flashback. It was weird because they had all the domed cities and stuff. So that's it what I thought seemed too, like yeah. Mandalore before the purge. But then it then it looked like Tomorrowland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was definitely getting Epcot vibes from it as well. I don't know, the whole like tram station thing reminded me of uh, Jurassic World of just that sort of flying around, I guess, on that and then seeing the different domes and seeing what different people or different dinosaurs there are and going through all these different exhibits and getting sort of like a tour of the city before you even go yeah. in. But then they were on that Hyperloop and, you know, it, it makes you think of the monorail, but it also you know, Elon Musk is trying to build and he's, he calls it the Hyperloop. Right. And I think they're wanting to build one down. I think the first one, if they, the, the first prototype would be done between Dallas and Houston and it would be, sounds like a really cool deal. And I want to ride it as long as they don't have all those lights flashing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> those seem unnecessary. I, 
what I've heard uh, about Elon Musk's version is it would be underground. Is, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. Probably not transparent and, and highly lit like that. And they probably would need more cars than just the one to. And hopefully work. they start off a little slower instead of slamming people into their seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> the the recording. This is not a request. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> this, this this episode was full of full of good one liners. Um, and then we get to the court where. I was kind of getting like Alice in Wonderland vibes, yes. like like from the mm-hmm. the Johnny Depp Alice in Wonderland movies. Yeah, that was I don't know. It was I I thought it was hilarious and a lot of fun. Um, I know I have several friends who thought it was just bizarre and over the top and hated it. <laughs> um, what did you guys think? I thought it was, you know, if you. I think Alice in Wonderland too, you know, and you had the, the weird drink with the creature and they come enjoy some secretions like, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but way to make it appetizing. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, it was so colorful and there were so many visual things in there is just, wow. They put a lot of work into that. Yeah. It reminded me a lot actually of cloud city from episode five of Vader having the whole like banquet out for them. Um, not that quite in the same moment, yeah. setting, but at first I was just kind of like, that's what I see. I just saw that comparison. And then it was like sort of seeing everyone there as well. And how that whole interaction went at the feast. It was a lot of everyone looking at the leaders as to what they were doing. And like, if they're eating, we'll eat with them. But then as soon as they like stand up and want to go, everyone's like, okay, we're done. We're going to follow them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting to see sort of how they, how they interacted because they were just sort of gluttonous a little bit, um, falling into that a bit. But I mean, what sort of royalty doesn't do that? (laughs) The virtuous kind, maybe. Uh, (laughs) There is any... You get the sense from all their talk about, you know, oh, we're, we're, we're a democracy and we do what the people want and so on. But, but yeah, these two are definitely the ones in charge. And uh, that, that idea that everybody's looking to them and following them in everything they do, that's well spotted. Yeah. Um, it's, it's such a weird kind of governance. It's because you've got, on the one hand, the planet seems to have been under imperial and then new republic administration. Uh, you know, they they you know they are allowed to do some things; they're not allowed to do other things. Um, you know, this this administrator was appointed to build them up, and yet they have royalty, and yet they're also a democracy. It's just like Naboo. Naboo, Padme, Padme was a, a elected queen. Elected queen, yeah, yeah. Who then stepped down from that? I, yeah, it's it's like, does that does that actually work? I mean, it seems to be the kind of thing that Star Wars does. Mm-hmm. Just mash everything together. Let's do the same thing with, with governments. <laughs> well, then, I mean, it seems like the Duchess would have has more power. But since she wanted to get married, because he was just like a civil engineer, basically, Captain, Mm -hmm. Captain Bombardier, Bombardier. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was just like a civil engineer and fell in love with the Duchess. And, but now that he's in essentially in power, the new Republic took any, cause he was Imperial, you know, and he, he went through the amnesty program. They took essentially any opportunity for him to rebel against the new Republic away. And so they're, you know, because he's there is the reason they can't have weapons. They can't have military. They Mm -hmm. can't have any of that stuff. It almost makes me think that if he was, if he wasn't there and in that power position with the Duchess, would they be able to do that? Unclear. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, 
I have so many questions about this sort of city planet state thing um, that, you know, is brand new in this episode. As far as I know, it's not appeared anywhere else in Star Wars lore. Um, so, yeah, it's. There's always been kind of a. a um, what do you call it? Like a, a, a commentary on on real world governance, you know, with the empire being very, very much modeled on, um, both, both the Roman empire and on, uh, Nazi Germany. And, um, and I don't know exactly is, is this supposed to be a commentary on the U S on something else? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. Um, or is it just, hey, this is Star Wars. Let's mash stuff together and <laughs> and, and enjoy it. Um, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's okay. Um, we we get to see a little more of the city as as um, Din and Bo Katan go on their adventure. Um, we see some of the. It seems like a generally wealthy society. Um, I wasn't sure quite what to make of the Ugnaughts, though. Um, the like the the Ugnaughts are an interesting case of, you know, you have a, a like an entire species who is, you know, like like an entire planets have basically one ecosystem and one government and like monocultures and an entire species seem to be kind of similar you know the ugnaughts are all um technicians and they're masterful with droids and and um and if you tell them their droids are malfunctioning they get very offended th deeply and and they yeah deny that anything is is going wrong at all um but they come around as if you speak very directly and say i have spoken <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I am glad that line has returned from, from season one. I, I love that, that sort of catchphrase. Well, it's funny to hear Din say it first before the Ugnaughts. And he's like, you're going to yeah. help me. I have spoken. And they're like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this guy knows what like, he's talking about. You know, it, it kind of raises these questions for me of, okay, well, are the Ugnaughts there by choice or are they there because the rest of society has put them there? And, and in a, in a connected way, a lot of this episode is dealing with droids and, you know, droids are kind of treated as, as an enslaved species yeah by the rest of the galaxy as well and and you know the class distinctions and the the um the rights of different kinds of peoples in the star wars universe it's it's not an easy question to to answer i think is like how how does this all work and what's right and wrong and what do they see as right and wrong i think in absolutely every piece of canon that we've seen ugnaughts are lower class workers mm -hmm. you know hondo has has them on his crew and he I think in that last episode of Rebels, it show he shows that oh man, I I, re I really need these guys. I really miss those guys, and <laughs> so he cares, but you know he still considers himself a higher class. And yeah, and I think in every other piece of canon that we've seen, it's the same. And I think that Din is the first one to treat them any differently. And he's always been that way with others. He he was that way with the Tuscans and and others. He can relate to these other groups, but with Quill, you know, he actually became a friend to Quill. You know, and and Quill was like, I I worked my I worked through my indentured 
servitude to the empire, I'm free. And and I wonder if these guys are wishing that they could be doing the same thing or if they got placed there. I don't know. You think they're indentured in, in the city? In I mean, they're the only ones working. Yeah. Everybody in that, the rest of that culture all relies on the droids that they're fixing. Yeah, and, and Hellgate said that, you know, if the droids didn't, uh, if they shut down the droids, then the people would have to start working and yeah. they wouldn't accept that. Yeah, He even said they point. will die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how accustomed did they really get to having those droids? And then it just reminds me of like Wally with all the people getting lazy and sitting in their chairs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and you can kind of see a, a comparison today to cell phones and technology and stuff, you know. I know at, you know, places I've worked, the computers go down, go home. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you can't go build that thing without that computer, you know. So, or, you know, we're... Maybe it's a commentary on life today in dealing with technology. Maybe we're not to that point where we're not. We can still do manual labor, but when it comes to like in the that job that I had, it was the permission to do it without the without that computer. You had no permission to go do that job. Yeah, or or the job itself is is a matter of technology yeah yeah technology and and literally cannot be done with without a computer right yeah maybe one of my favorite moments in the episode was was the uh the resistor the <laughs> the robot bar which i i started out not liking because it's like oh they've got droids you know drinking um just like organics would go into a bar and drink but they started talking about the you know uh the nepenthe and i thought oh that's actually pretty clever as as a reason for droids to gather at a bar um but it also really uh for lack of a better word humanized the droids even more than than i think we've seen them humanized before yeah, like they need relax and re rest and relaxation. These are droids on their downtime. Yeah. It's also funny to think that a droid needs downtime in general. You know, they're designed to be able to work and yet they need to go to a bar and relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's this whole weird kind of trying to have it both ways that Star Wars has had from the beginning with droids. You know, are they are they people? Or are they machines? And they're they're kind of treated like machines, but you know they Until are. Until you've gained a personal they connection act like with people. them. Yeah. And you know, in Solo, the movie, um, we had an actual droid claiming rights as a person in an explicit way, and and when she when that droid was destroyed. You, yeah. had a, you had a human who was very distraught about it. And also, and even in the scene in the resistor, it seemed like they were all afraid to be decommissioned, which means they essentially have emotions, too. Mm-hmm. Johnny Five is alive. <laughs> well, and, and it does, I mean, it comes back to, like, all sorts of conversations we're having today. It's like, you know, they're, they're like, oh, we, you know, after after the Empire took over, some of us were considered you know we're going to be decommissioned and then when the new republic took over more of us were going to be decommissioned and and this gives us a reason to still exist and and if they if they get rid of us who's gonna take our job you know we're afraid that the humans are going to take our jobs which is you know literally a mirror to you know are the are the machines going to take our jobs yeah and i mean with that, even with AI today and how much that's evolving and seeing sort of where that ends up in the moral morality in general of using AI, where that comes into play. 
it yeah it raises all all kinds of interesting questions and and then kind of moves right on to the next action sequence. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it gives you a second to think about it. And it's just like, okay, moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else about like the, the whole Plazir 15 environment? Um, what, what did you think of the, of the cameos specifically of, of the, the stars who, who filled out this episode? I think Jack Black did, did his Jack Black. And I was okay with it. <laughs> Christopher Lloyd was, I mean, he was a bald Doc Brown and I was okay with it. I, I do think that it was weird how they summed up his little story so fast. Um, oh, he's a separatist and that's it. Done. But uh, Lizzo, yeah, I, you know, I think she needs to take some acting classes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, she was a little, little could, a little flat. Yeah. She, yeah, that, that one didn't work for me. I, I she worked for me. I, I think she, um, I mean, I think she did the, like the over the top affection with Jack Black pretty well. And I thought she did the, I'm speaking from authority, pay attention to me pretty well. And, and I, I thought that was kind of what there was for her character. So I don't know. For me, it just seemed like she was reading from cue cards or something that, uh, that that's where I was going with her acting. It just, it, it was the acting itself. I, I just didn't think she did a very good job. Now, you know, a few of the scene, like the scene where they're, uh, playing that, you know, Star Wars croquet, you know, <laughs> yes. doing stuff like that. That was pretty neat. And, and that, that crazy virtual train she had, that was, you know, it gave me the whole queen of hearts vibe from Alice in Wonderland. And so that stuff was cool, but it just, to me, it almost felt like she was reading cue cards. Uh, I, I sort of, didn't care enough about their acting, I guess, just in general. <laughs> like, even like I un I understood they were cameos, but it was more so just kind of like, all right, what's their point here? Why why do we need this? Um, and I guess that's the one nice thing about me not really knowing actors that well is that I don't <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if they're a cameo or not. It's just I care about the story. Um, I think that they still sort of kept the plot going um the only thing i didn't like about the characters themselves was lizzo's like back fan thing that she had it was very digital and i didn't like that part of her costume that is so, my only it's... like gripe with anything about them was that back piece specifically <laughs> and, and, I'm, and i'm over here saying i think that was neat <laughs> <laughs> it it was I didn't know what it was until my second viewing of mm -hmm. the episode. I, I was distracted and it's like, wait, what is that? What is going on? Is it, I thought it was like an alien creature following her around or something. It was like a virtual um, train is what it, yeah, you know? Yeah. Weird. It didn't seem to fit the costume or really much about it. I mean, like I understand the idea behind like a duchess having these extravagant dresses and outfits and things like that. But, like, they could have done so much better with an outfit like that. And it felt like it was one of those, like, Fortnite backpacks that you would get in a video game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my immediate thought to it, was a Fortnite backpack that you would wear in the video game. So <laughs> I, I can see that, yeah. <laughs> and that, that was my issue with it. It's like, I don't like that. But, I mean, like, I think that they all played their parts well. I mean, I loved Christopher Lloyd as his spot um he he did it well i mean i think that absolutely suited him um jack black i think he did really well with sort of balancing this idea of trying to be good again in the from the empire and wanting mm. sort of wanting to do good and even with sort of the whole nano droid situation when it was first being talked about he's like i swear i had nothing to do with this like this wasn't me 
And I think that's also interesting to see because we're also sort of following the other side of um, the doctor following his whole path and wanting to do good and just do his work. Mm -hmm. And seeing how in the amnesty program they're still seen as doing wrong. Yeah. No matter as to who, like what they, what's going on, they're an easy pin to blame, put the blame on. I almost want them to come back and, and like be part of this, this Pershing Mm storyline because of that. Well, I think that if we wouldn't have had that storyline explaining the amnesty program to begin with, Mm. when they said that he was in amnesty program, we'd all just been going, what? But, it's tying in those other episodes. Now we know where he's at. I mean, as soon as they said he's been through the amnesty program, he's, he was an Imperial. Now he's doing this thing. Now it all clicked immediately for us. They didn't have to do any more backstory on it. I, I, I was wondering the whole episode though, you know, how many times did he go through the, it's not a mind flare, really, it's not a mind flare <laughs> machine. It's very refreshing. Yes. <laughs> and also their location relative to the Republic makes it seem like how much did he really have a play in the Empire and like how much, I guess, did he really need to go through a rehabilitation? And was his process the same as the others who have gone through it? Well, Pershing was from the Outer Rim as well, so... True. But then he stayed on Coruscant. This person was probably in the Outer Rim and then stayed in the Outer Rim because of his love life. You think? Possibly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so much we don't know. Yeah. And may never know, because I doubt they can afford to have Jack Black as a as a se- series regular. <laughs> Probably um, not. Unless he's just a um, super fan and is like, I'll do it for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I guarantee Christopher Lloyd is not doing it for free. Um, <laughs> I, I did love, though, when he was brought forward, um, um, the, the Duchess has this little speech when they're sentencing him. Um, and it seems like, you know, they're, they're talking about, they're comparing the, um, uh, Hellgate, uh, Christopher Lloyd's character to, um, Bombardier, Jack Black's character and talking about forgiveness. And the Duchess says, sure. He, uh, Bombardier has made some mistakes in the past, but who among us is not? Is there no room for a little bit of forgiveness in a galaxy so vast? Hellgate replies, perhaps someday I can earn such forgiveness from your grace. And I thought that was a really interesting little exchange. You know, what, what does forgiveness mean to these people? What does redemption mean? Is it the same thing as it means to the Mandalorians, to Din, um, who is seeking redemption? I don't know. Is it status, honor, or is it just being able to be in relationship again? I mean, that's that's what what it is in, in the Christian faith, right, is just being able to be in relationship again. You know, when mm-hmm. you've hurt somebody, you've damaged that relationship. And when you when you reconcile with each other, reconciliation right you you're back in friendship you're back in relationship Mm -hmm. but is that what it means to them i don't know sort of i guess still playing along with those lines of sort of catholicism reference i mean unleashing nanobots onto a society and having them all fear for their lives is pretty much a mortal sin um (laughs) I think we can agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but with that, then you sever your relationship entirely. If you commit a mortal sin, there is no relationship there until you get sort of a forgiveness. I mean, until you've been reconciled. Yeah. Right? Until, but yeah. sort of with that, his punishment then was to go into exile. He yeah. cannot have any sort of contact with them. If you're in exile, which I think sort of models sort of that mortal sin. And then, seeking forgiveness afterwards perfectly yeah the word that jumped out at me was earn such forgiveness to earn it 
And that's, that's the part that like really kind of made my, made my Catholic, made the hairs on the back yeah. of my Catholic neck. Cause there's nothing we up. can do to earn it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that the forgiveness is offered even, even before we repent. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the assurance of God's forgiveness is the reason we repent in a way. It's like, oh yeah, I, I can repent because I know God still loves me, even if I have failed in my love of God. Right. Um, and, and yet I think both for the Mandalorians and, and for the Plazir 15 nights, um, <laughs> <laughs> what shall we call them? Plazirians. Um, the, the idea that forgiveness is a thing to be earned is is a pretty solid part of what they're thinking there well and and even for the new republic that you know they're looking for the amnesty candidates to earn their way I mean, into it, it almost makes me sound like it sounds to me like it's a matter of trust you know because we we use mm. that terminology too that you know you have to earn your trust earn my trust again and that sort of thing uh, mm. so maybe maybe that's why they're saying you know he he can't be trusted anymore and he wants to try to regain that trust yeah and trust is essential to relationship and it makes me wonder how long he he would had been there in that position you know was he just playing like a super long game because at this point the clone wars was 30 years <laughs> which, which you know. year are you talking about here um uh, Hel or, hellgate or hellgate yeah. yeah yeah you know did he uh was he was he just playing a super long game or you know he he liked his position and then just was like i think i'm here now i i can do something about this you know uh about the you know count dooku getting killed and everything else i can fix it it was just a a thought of the day or was he playing a 30 year long game? I don't know. That is something that I sort of thought interesting as well was more so about his relation to Count Dooku rather than the separatists as a whole. Um, Count Dooku had different motives than the separatists entirely. He saw it more so as the Republic was corrupt and needs reform. And this is our way of getting the attention needed to be able to bring about those changes. Hmm. And he saw the corruption within the Senate, within the Jedi Order, and all these things, and he just wanted to bring about the change and not sort of have this violence and whatnot. And yet, I don't know. I, I just saw that as an interesting thing rather than focusing on the separatists, which were sort of fighting this war to just benefit themselves. He was, Dooku saw it more so as benefiting society as a whole. I definitely got the sense that Hellgate was, was inspired directly by Dooku's charisma and his vision of justice, of order, of, um, yeah, I'm not too brushed up right now on the whole Count Dooku's motives behind everything, but I have at least the general idea <laughs> of um, yeah, everything there, of him sort of wanting recognizing the corruption and then wanting to fix it, rather than the own self-interest like other groups had. Well, anything else about, like, the, the I don't know, I suppose we can call it a side quest um, in, in Plazir 15? In yeah. the city itself. The only other thing I had within it was sort of focusing back in on our main characters. Um, oh, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, they were in there too. <laughs> um, Din had to do a lot of the talking compared to Bo-Katan, who is yes. going to sort of be shaped into the leader of Mandalore, it seems. And yet, Din is the one who had to talk to the Ugnaughts, who had to talk to the droids, who had to talk to the duchess even and he knew how to talk to them he's had these experiences and these relations that Bo also seems like she should have had with her background pretty impressive mm -hmm. background too 
um, yet Din is able to connect, communicate with these different people and get across to the point he needs rather than just say, talk to me, I need this information. It's a, it's pleasing the people to then be able to have a civil conversation with them. So I've been in leadership positions before and, and I've had, I've taken a lot of training on leadership and they've talked about, you know, if you surround yourself with people that are, you know, you can't know it all. You can't be the expert at everything, right? So you have to, you know, bring in somebody that's good at this part and good at that part. And if you can be that person that brings in those people around you, you're going to be successful, especially if you're all on the same mission. So I could see, as you were talking about that, I could see Bo-Katan and Din being a good partnership you know, with with her being the figurehead for the, especially for the the night owls and and the other ones, you know, the ones that claim to have Mandalorian blood, and then um, Din being sort of the more of a figurehead for the children of the watch, but then working together, and you know, maybe she's good at this thing, and he's good at like you were saying, good at communicating. You know, she could use that to her advantage and he can use her for other things and they could work together. And you used the term earlier, buddy cop, you know, hmm. both of them at one point in this or a couple points in this episode, one was good cop. The other was bad. I think Din was generally the bad cop, but, uh, you know, it worked for him. He's mostly bad cop with the droids. Yeah. Um, like his, his, he is just straight up anti-droid and has been from the beginning um but he's he's also the one who's in touch with all of the other sort of lower classes as as you were saying earlier yeah. and and Bo-Katan is definitely the the one who's you know my family used to rule this planet um and and so she's in touch with the the yeah the I don't know the expectations of of aristocracy, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's she was also she spent like most of the season questioning her ability to rule, and um, you know, even on the on the tram ride out to meet with the the mercenary Mandalorians, she didn't have a plan. <laughs> She didn't have a plan. She wasn't sure, you know, Din was reassuring her, you know, you're a Mandalorian. They followed you before. They'll follow you again. She's like, I don't know. And yet. She definitely has something of the gravitas of a ruler. Of a leader in a way that that Din never has. Yeah, she certainly showed that when they went on their, uh, when the children of the watch went on those little missions to save yeah. to save the foundling and then to you know save navarro she was in charge mm -hmm. and she had a plan she knew what was happening she was able to tell everybody communicate the plan to everybody else so you know she has her skills so she's yeah, more it, of like a war leader there than an actual like political leader i guess yeah, well, and she even says that she hates politics when she stuns Hellgate. So, <laughs> yeah. So maybe that you know maybe that's how they work together. He's the. It's kind of cool how we talk this out, right? He, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. She's the 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 warrior leader. He's the political leader. That that works pretty good. Hmm. The diplomat. I could see that happen. Maybe. I yeah that that would be an interesting. I, I I definitely don't think Din would be comfortable in such a role. Um, he wouldn't like it. Um, I think his preference is kind of to go in guns blazing. <laughs> but uh, I think he'll do what he's told when he's in those group situations, mm -hmm. and you know, any he, any he did. But if he's going to be by himself, Fair he's going to do it his own way. Yeah, and. I know we're running a little over time here, but uh, we still got to talk I don't about think we can... the challenge. 
Yeah, we got to talk about the dark saber here. Yeah. So let's talk about it. What do you guys think? Technically, then none of them in that entire fight own the dark saber by those terms. Okay, say more. Okay, so Maul technically got it stolen from him by Sabine and Ezra in Rebels, which is why it's sort of in this path, right? Sure. So technically, the saber belongs to Maul. And so then Maul got defeated by Kenobi. Kenobi got defeated by Vader. Luke defeats Vader. And therefore, Luke is the rightful owner. <laughs> <laughs> Te- technically speaking, since he got defeated in combat, he didn't get defeated in combat. Maul still has claim to the throne. And then it follows I, that. So I think, didn't uh, Ahsoka beat Maul in... Uh... Season seven. Oh yeah. So then Ahsoka would have it. Ahsoka gets beat by Vader eventually, still. But then she gets pulled out of that. So then technically, does it stay with her? I don't know. But so I mean, are are you gonna say that Sabine did not defeat Maul when she took the dark she never no, fought it was, him. It was sitting in his cave, and she just kind of was like yoink. <laughs> okay. Okay. She just yoinked it out of his cave on his little trophy. Um. So I. Technically, none of them should have the dark saber, but they do, and they're using it to lay claim. Maybe that's why all the bad luck's happening. Maybe it's, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's just the fact that you know somebody had it and and you beat them, and now you own it. I I don't know, but if we're gonna go that other route, I would say Ahsoka. Well, and we don't know exactly how Gideon Moff Gideon got it in the first place. Um, I mean it's. Uh, he, Last we knew from Rebels, uh, uh, Bo-Katan still had it. And then at the beginning of The Mandalorian, we see that that, uh, Moff Gideon has it. So somewhere it changed hands there. When that first season of Mandalorian came out, I had never watched, I'd only watched a few episodes of Clone Wars and none of the Mandalorian episodes. And I'd never seen any of Rebels. And he pops on that, last episode he pops that dark saber out and i'm like what is that <laughs> <laughs> and once i you know and then i listened to this particular podcast and i'm like they started explaining i'm like i gotta go watch all those shows <laughs> oh yeah you gotta watch rebels but man watch it seeing that for the first time was just it was amazing i'm like oh there's something there <laughs> I, I was showing the Ahsoka trailer to a friend of mine today and she was like, oh my goodness, that looks so amazing. That looks so great. And I'm like, yeah, are you as big a Rebels fan as I am? And she's like, I haven't watched any of Rebels. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you are missing so much yeah. from this trailer. You got to see Rebels. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole kind of, like Mandalorian culture seems to be like really doubling down on these arbitrary rules. Like, you know, well, for the children of the watch, you can't take off your helmet. Why can't you take off your helmet? It's not the way, um, you know, it's like, well, our way is that the ruler of Mandalore must hold the dark saber. And, and so <laughs> it's like, okay, but why? Well, because that's our way. And, and, and it's like, these traditions seem like really, you know, fiercely clung to and, and yet, you know, really impractical in a lot of ways. Yes. Yeah. Well, so the prophecy of the mythosaur as well. I don't know. I still believe yeah. either Grogu or Din are going to be riding the mythosaur in it at some point, and then Bo Katan's going to see it, and that's going to cause a conflict. <laughs> I'm I'm seeing a lot of conflict arise as well between the Mandalorian tribes now at this point, because as soon yep. as Din showed up as well, he was sort of like, oh, he wasn't actually born on Mandalore. He's not a Mandalorian then. But then and, she gave that speech about how he's more of a Mandalorian than any of them, or as yeah. much of one anyway. As much yeah. anyway, yeah. Yeah, but there's still that tension then between the two. Yeah. I mean, I don't see that as going away. I think it would be really interesting to see those two tribes together. You know, the 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 night owl group. I don't know if they're all night owls, but that group, and then mm-hmm. uh, the children of the watch. Seeing them, if they could coexist, that'd be really interesting. 
I feel like we may see that next episode. So that's my guess is that the next episode will be the actual assault on Mandalore, which is going to be like an assault on those more what, those the, Morlock characters. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> the, those. I'm guessing it's going to be something like that or just trying to get to the Mythosaur as well for Bo Katan. Definitely for Bo, that's Bo Katan, that's going to be a a goal, but like just I mean they kind of just have to live land there and start rebuilding and survive to retake Mandalore at, at, at least as far as I can tell. Are they going to have all their food and everything flown in or, or can you plant through the glass I, I doubt it who knows i mean i mean i've seen magicians that eat glass but um <laughs> yeah well are they all magicians then <laughs> maybe they are <laughs> <laughs> uh, i don't know honestly this season of the mandalorian has just surprised me at every turn yep. um mm-hmm. maybe that's because i'm not that good at predicting what will come next but <laughs> um join the club <laughs> <laughs> So I, I mean, I expect they're going to, they're going to try and retake Mandalore, but I don't know what that's going to look like. Well, any other thoughts about this, this wild and wacky episode? I just can't wait to see where we go. And I I personally hope that, uh, I mean, maybe I'm not in Catherine's camp of, you know, marriage between Ben and Din and Bo, you know, but, uh. (laughs) <laughs> at least a part yeah, i wouldn't a, ship them that hard <laughs> a, a part, partnership would be really cool and and i hope that they you know they can unite the unite the tribes or clans whatever but uh i'm interested to see where that goes and i cannot wait for ahsoka that's going to be awesome uh yeah august cannot come soon enough i'm not ready to start senior year of college so i'm i'm, I'm okay waiting till <laughs> august <laughs> uh... don't wish time away right <laughs> but you'll be fine yeah i i want to see the conflict between the groups i'm all for a civil war they can have another i i i don't see them as getting along and i want to see the tension rise between the groups i think that might be uh season four um i mean i i I think they've got to work together for a little while before they before they start fighting each other Mm -hmm. but i agree the the tension will be will be exciting and something to watch. Yeah, and who knows where that'll go for the rest of the season even. All right. Well, it's now time to take a moment and uh, thank our patrons who make it possible to create Secrets of Star Wars. And uh, we'd like to especially include Lucas D., Russell T., Joe S., Stephen B., and Charlene C., uh, their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Wars and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Uh, be sure to subscribe to us in uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, our heart iHeartRadio, anywhere you get podcasts, um, or you can follow us on the SQPN YouTube channel. You can find previous episodes of Secrets of Star Wars at sqpn.com slash Star Wars, and we would love to hear your feedback at our email, starwars at sqpn.com. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook uh, at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on Twitter, at SQPN. And we, as uh, Josh was saying, we've got a really active Discord community. Uh, You can join at sqpn.com slash Discord. We'll be back next time discussing the the next episode of The Mandalorian. Who knows what it will bring? We hope to see you there. Uh, Till then, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Wars. Um... Jason, it's great to have you on. Thanks for having me again, guys. And Josh, always a pleasure to talk with you. Always have fun. (laughs) All right. Once again, I have been Robert King. Thanks for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy. The Secrets of Doctor Who. 
Find the show wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Doctor Who.